What a dump. We gotta go in five minutes. I've got nothing to wear. There's nothing to eat. Green's too small. I wish I had a Tesla. It's hard to be thankful when you're too busy. Complaining, grumbling, whining, exactly. It, it, it's hard to be thankful when, when you're fixated on the things that aren't going well, the things that aren't kind of set up the way you want them to be set up. We're sort of in the shadow still of Thanksgiving. I don't know about your home, but in our home, we had, we had turkey on Thanksgiving, and we had turkey the next day on Friday, and we had turkey yesterday on Saturday, uh, and now the turkey's gone. How many of you still have some turkey left in the fridge, right? Okay, but it's, I mean, it's still, we're right, I mean, we're still in that Thanksgiving moment, but it's easy just to kind of move on. Because, you know, you're supposed to be thankful one day a year, you know, right? I mean, that's how it works. And I think we live in a culture that too often is missing, is leaving behind the, the heart and the passion of Thanksgiving. I, I read a little listicle. These are the kind of the articles that are a list of things uh, that somebody had on, on some ideas for Thanksgiving, it's just, just a few days before Thanksgiving, and I'm going through this little list of ideas for Thanksgiving, and one of their ideas was this. They said, you know, it's so tired and old, this, you know, go around the table and everybody share something they're thankful for. It's just so tired and old. Just don't do that this year. But they, but they didn't replace it with anything to be thankful for in place of it. It's like, you know, if there's one thing you should not do this Thanksgiving is, you know, give thanks. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's like, really? Really, that's the, you know, because it's not hip and cool, because you've done it before, throw it out. No, every day we should go around the table and say what we're thankful for. Every day we should quietly in our own hearts say what we're thankful for. Because, because God calls us to a place of genuine thankfulness. Our, our message title today is, With Thanks, Your Name Here. Have you ever, have you ever written a letter and you finished a letter or written a, an email and, and you finished, With Thanks. Kevin Garth Harney, with thanks, your name here. Or thankfully yours. And you know, we don't really even sign things anymore. We just kind of drop off the end and don't even put our name unless it's already attached, you know. And it's just, but, but I wonder if, if your day, your normal day, had a signature at the bottom of it. If it would say, with thanks, my name. Or if it would say, with whining, grumbling, and complaining, my, my name here. I wonder what marks our days, because our days aren't marked by what we say we believe. Our days are marked by how we live and how we speak and how we behave. And every day can kind of finish with, with thanks or with complaints. And it's hard to be thankful when you're busy complaining. And so we're going to think about that today. We're going to dig deep into God's word. We're going to grapple with, uh, with this uh, uh, reality from the scriptures. And so we're going to look at two parts of the Bible. One part we're going to look at comes from Exodus and Numbers in the beginning of the Old Testament uh, where God's people are in their desert wanderings. And then we're going to look in the first century, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. If you have your device, just kind of open up your Bible app and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll get there in just a moment. But I want to talk about this time in history, which is kind of the best of times and worst of times. Uh, it was a hard time for God's people. Uh, the, the time is about a 14, the middle of the 1400s B.C., mid-1400s B.C., and God's people had been prisoners in Egypt for about four centuries. They had been enslaved. They, had, they were working as slave labor. They were being horribly treated. And God set them free. It's called the Exodus. The book of Exodus is all about that. And they're set free, and they're going to a place called the Promised Land. Now, you say, I don't even know what the Promised Land is, but it just sounds like fun, doesn't it? I'm going to the Promised Land. I mean, that sounds like a good place. And then when people would describe it, they'd say, well, it's flowing with milk and honey. That sounds pretty good. Even if you're not a milk and honey person, it's like, well, it's the Promised Land flowing with milk and honey, and they're leaving bondage and slavery in Egypt. But here's the challenge. In the time that they left Egypt, what well, should have taken them a couple of months to go through the desert and go into the promised land flowing with milk and honey, it took over 40 years. 
And, and, so, and so they're, they're on this journey, and on this journey of the desert, it's called the desert wanderings, for 40 years they're in the desert, we discover that they had incredible moments of joy and celebration in God's goodness, and they also had moments of pain and struggle and heartache. And I believe that that's actually not just the people of Israel at that time, I believe that's all people at all times. I believe if we're honest, every single day of our life, has wonderful, beautiful, fantastic moments, if we'll pay attention and notice, and every single day of our life is gonna have some pain and struggle and sorrow for us or someone we love or someone around us. And if you're one of those people, if you're, if you're waiting, you say, I'm waiting for that day, for that time in my life when everything's going well, where everyone I know is healthy and where I have plenty of money and resources and where the entire world has experienced world peace and where everyone in the United States is getting along and, and all you know, hugging each other and being happy with each other even when they disagree and, and, that, and that, you know, I don't have a crick in my neck or a pain in my back. I'm waiting for that day when everything's going perfect. Can I, can I just tell you as, as a pastor, real honestly, it's not coming. <laughs> don't live with this utopian hope of perfection in your life or in your family or in your marriage or at your workplace because life is this mingling of wonderful and challenging. And this is what the people of Israel in the middle 1400s BC discovered. It was a hard time, this 40-year wandering in the wilderness. Why? Number one, because they were in a desert. And living in a desert is just hot and sandy and difficult. And in the desert, people tend to complain, it's hot, it's sandy, it's difficult. And that was what was going on with God's people then. It was a time of waiting. And no one loves waiting. Have you ever been at Disneyland or Disney World or one of these places that have these queues of lines that go back and forth for like infinity? And then you turn the corner and you realize that there's another 47 rows back and forth, right? And in those moments, there's just an overwhelming sense of thankfulness, right? No, it's so easy when you're waiting to get grumpy, to get negative, to complain. Maybe you're at Disneyland, but you're waiting in line. And, you're not focused, you know, and, and it's easy to focus on that. And then also, it was a hard time because they were paying the price of their unfaithfulness. The people of Israel were in the wilderness because they had come to the edge of the promised land and they had sent 12 of these leaders to go into the promised land to assess it and come back with a report. They came back with a report, and 10 of them said, we can't do it. We can't you know, take this land. There's too many people. It's too difficult. And two of them said, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's beautiful. We trust God. We can go into the land. And the voice of the 10 prevailed. And the people said, not only said, hey, we're going to stay in the desert. You know what they said? We want to go back to Egypt. We want to go back to slavery. When God had delivered them and set them free, and they're talking about going back to slavery. So God actually says to them, listen, this generation for 40 years, you'll wait in the desert, and this generation, when they pass away, the next generation, if they'll be faithful and follow me, they can go into the promised land. So now they're not only waiting for 40 years, they're waiting because they had messed up. And there's nothing more fun and thank-filled than knowing we've messed up and paying the consequences, right? So, 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 so this was a hard time for God's people, but watch this now, pay attention. At the same time, during these 40 years, that there's all these, you know, they're in a desert, it's difficult, they're waiting, they're paying the consequence of their sins. At the same time, there's all kinds of things to be happy about. It was an amazing and miraculous time, this 40 years in the desert. Here's how it began. They had been set free from slavery in Egypt. Exodus chapter 1 through 12. They had been set free by the mighty hand of God. I mean, you can't miss that. You can't, they, for 400 years, they've been in bondage. They've been set free. That's pretty good. That deserves an amen, praise the Lord. Somebody say that. Amen. I mean, that, that's a good thing, being set free from bondage, right? So that was right, like that was just right in their rear view mirror. they just come out of Egypt. Also, they had seen God part the sea. They were trapped up against the edge of the Red Sea. The Egyptian army was coming to slaughter them. And God goes like this. I don't know if he made that noise, but I mean, he... But he just, he just like parts the water and they get to walk across. That's pretty cool. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And this generation had seen that. They had walked through the sea on dry land. Pretty amazing, right? They got that in their memory banks. That's something to thank God for. God was present in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. While they're in the desert wandering, they can look outside their tent any night and like burning is this giant pillar of fire, a reflection of God's presence with them. And the daytime, a pillar of cloud or smoke. So they could see God's presence. That should cause them to be thankful. God provided food and water in the desert. Manna, quail, and water for all the people that needed food. 
amazing, miraculous, heavenly provision. That should make you pretty thankful, right? I mean, it's starting to, you know, there's lots of good things going on. And Christ was there in kind of a strange way. We find out in 1 Corinthians 10, which we'll be looking in a moment, that, that this rock that poured water out of it, and if you pay big water bills in Monterey, it'd be nice to get one of those, wouldn't it? Giant rock that just pours water out for free, right? But, that, but it says, but that rock that traveled with them that poured out water was the presence of Jesus Christ. That's pretty cool. So here's the reality. Here's God's people for 40 years, and they're in the desert, and if they look over this way and turn their hearts this way, they can focus on that it's a desert, it's dry, it's dusty, we're waiting, it's no fun, we're paying the consequence of our bad choices, and they can fix it on the negative and complain and whine, very possible for them at that moment and for us any day of our lives, or they could fixate and focus on you know, God did deliver us from Egypt, and he did part the Red Sea, and there's a pillar of fire, he's with us, and he's providing food for us, and he's, he's with us, and there's water coming out of this rock, and, and they could focus on that. And, and, and in many, many ways, this is kind of the decision we have to make over and over and over again in our lives. Are we going to focus on that which is hard and difficult and painful, which is always present, and then are we going to continually whine and grumble and complain about how bad life is? which we can all do at any given time? Or are we going to fixate and focus on God's presence and his power and his glory, his provision, his protection? I mean, are we going to focus on God and celebrate his goodness? Because this is life. You can make that choice. For our family right now, you know, we're, we're in a time where on the one hand, uh, we have a, a, first, uh, a first grandchild for Sherry and I, a first child for Nate and Bryn, and we're celebrating that and enjoying that. And on the other hand, we have a family member right now who's battling cancer, who's been paralyzed from the waist down because of cancer, relatively young man, and he's battling this day after day. And you say, well, you know, what, about the, what, about, what, what about those perfect days? I can really thank God when everything's going perfect. Guess what? That day is not coming until Jesus returns. And so in this lifetime, we decide to be aware of the pain and aware of the struggle and suffering and to, and to seek to manage it the best we can and bring God's grace in the midst of it, but we focus our hearts on thanking God and celebrating his goodness even in the hard times. So in, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, the apostle Paul sets the stage. He's, he's pointing us back to this time in the middle 1400s BC when God's people are in the desert wandering and he kind of gives us the background. So look at verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 10. The Apostle Paul says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud. All right, that's the cloud of, of, of smoke and the cloud of fire. And they all passed through the sea, God parting the Red Sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That was kind of their baptism with Moses through this whole experience. Verse 3, they all ate the same spiritual food, the manna and the quail. They drank the same spiritual drink, water from a rock. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Although I'm sure they didn't realize that, saying the very presence of Jesus was there with them, even if they didn't catch it and understand it. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. You never see that, first, that fifth verse of 1 Corinthians 10 on like a poster or a plaque, you know, on someone's wall. Um, <laughs> Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them, and their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. They so fixated on the negative. They so fixated when they looked at the promised land on what they couldn't overcome, they forgot the God who had parted the Red Sea, who had set them free, and who could overcome everything. And so they stayed in the desert and talked about going back to Egypt. And they stayed in that desert for 40 years until a new generation grew up, and most of them died in the desert. So why, 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 why are we thinking about this? Why are we talking about this? Because this is a picture, I believe, of our lives Here's the question. Where do you focus when life is mingled with real pain and astounding goodness? Because this is life. This is life. Until we see Jesus face to face. Every marriage will be mingled with difficulty and pain and struggles and glory and beauty and hope. Every home will have struggles and pain and beauty and wonder in the presence of Jesus. Every work environment and every job you have will have difficult, hard things and wonderful things. The question is, will we fixate and focus? And here's the human tendency over here. This is what's wrong. This is what's hard. This is what's ugly. This is what's painful. This is what is... And, and, and the declarations in many cases might be true, but it can consume our hearts and our lives, and that's what happened with the people of Israel. 
while there's a pillar of cloud and fire, they can't even see the presence of God because they're fixating on what they don't have, what they want to have, and where they want to be, and they're not experiencing God's presence among them. They're fixating on the desert and the struggles, and, and it tainted their whole outlook. This passage is really heavenly examples and warnings, and saying, it's saying, pay attention. And the Apostle Paul is actually clear. He's very clear that these things are written down for us to learn these lessons so we don't have to repeat what they repeated in the middle 1400s BC. We can learn from their struggles and not follow in their footsteps. So continue with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll pick up at verse 6 where we left off. Now these things occurred as examples, listen to this, to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. It's saying, don't behave this way. Don't go down that path. And what the Apostle Paul is going to show us is that in those times when you're, when you're in real life with real beauty and real glory and real pain and real sorrow, when you fixate and focus on what you don't have and the difficulties of life, there's ways that the enemy tries to come in, the enemy of your soul tries to come in and take you even further down that road. And he actually gives the four primary sins and acts of rebellion of God's people in this time in the desert. When God is present and providing, but they're fixated on what they don't have, and they go down these four roads again and again and again. So here they are. Here's the four, and if you have your own Bible, something to write with or highlight with, mark these four things. Because these can happen in our hearts when we get ourselves fixated on what we don't have, what we want, and what we think God hasn't done for us. So verse 7 of, of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, Do not become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they got up to indulge in revelry. So hit the pause button right there. It says, don't be idolaters. While God was present in their camp and with them, they made a golden calf and bowed down to it. So how does that happen? Because they had turned their back away from God, and they were focusing on what they didn't have. And they forgot that God was right there with them. So they made this false God, this idol, this, this golden calf, it says, behold, this is the one who took you out of Egypt. And the God who took him out of Egypt was right there with him. How, so how does that happen? Paul's saying, be careful, this can happen to you. We'll talk more about that. Then the passage goes on. Verse 8. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. It says, don't commit sexual immorality. Again, when, when God is present, but when we're focusing on the struggles of life and the pain of life and the hardships of life, one of the temptations the enemy says is, hey, try this, it'll feel good. Well, what do you mean by this? There's a thousand different variations. But the enemy says, try. sexual immorality opens up the door to all kinds of things. The enemy can say, you know, you deserve it. Just spend an hour or two just viewing this or doing that or engaging in this. Just pay a little bit of money to experience that. And, and, and God says, beware. Paul says, the people of Israel, they, they fell into sexual immorality because they were focused on what they didn't have and, and weren't focused on God's provision. And so they went to satisfy themselves through things that weren't going to honor God and weren't going to truly satisfy their souls. Then the third thing says in verse 9, we should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. That, that, that when times are difficult and we turn our back on the goodness and the glory and the presence of God and focus only on the struggles of life, we can start to test God. God, you're not even faithful. God, you never take care of me. God, you never provide for me. And like over here, the man is piling up and the quail is waist high and there's water pouring out of the rock and we're saying, God, you do nothing for me. That's testing God. And that's what they were doing. So Paul says, be careful because when you're in real life with real joy and real sorrow and you fixate on the sorrow and the pain, you can start testing God and questioning God's goodness when his goodness is right there all around you. And the fourth one, which is we're gonna focus on the most today, and listen closely, this is the fourth major sin of God's people in the wilderness. Verse 10, and do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. So well, wait a minute, grumbling is not a sin. Complaining and whining is not a sin. It's actually a gift I have. <laughs> and I don't even have to try. I'm so good at it. I just can see what's wrong with everything and I can point it out to everybody. That's not a sin. Can I, can I stand here as a pastor and tell you Grumbling and whining and complaining is a sin before God. When God is present with you and you say God isn't there, you know, when, when God is providing and you say, I got nothing, there's, there's nothing to eat, there's nothing to, to, there's nothing to wear, there's nothing, you know, that video, joy, you know, that video that you saw earlier, Tyler, who was up here, uh, Tyler, who's our student ministries pastor, that was his wife. And she's nothing like that, she was acting. <laughs> 
But, that, that, but, but when God just piles up blessings around us and we complain about what we don't have, that's a sin before God and it's a sin before the world. So if you're a note taker, you can write down in your notes there. We provide a little sheet for you in the bulletin if you want to write these, these key four areas down. Here's the four big warnings. We're going to focus on the fourth one today, but I want to give these to you just one more time to, to say, boy, in those moments when, when you had those times of life where all I can see, I can't see the goodness and the blessing and the presence of God and his provision. All I can see, I'm fixated over here on all I don't have and all that isn't working. I'm in a desert and it's hard and it's difficult and this hurts and that hurts and that's all I can think about. Here's four warnings for you to be careful you don't get drawn in to these. Number one, don't turn your heart to idols when the real and living God is right there with you. Be careful that when God is present in your life, but there's difficult things, you don't turn your back on God and say, oh, well, God, since you're not meeting my needs, I'll find something or someone who will. That becomes idolatrous. There's this warning, be careful. You know, be careful. In your marriage, in your workplace, in your life situation, where all you see is what's wrong. And then you start to pursue whatever you want and you forget about the God who's been so good to you. Second warning, don't be seduced by immoral sexual temptation when we are offered the joy and goodness of God honoring sexuality. It says, be careful that you don't get drawn into sexual immorality and temptation. Man, when you're not seeing God's presence, when you're you're not acknowledging God's goodness and God's provision, and all you can focus on is what you don't have and how hard your life is, it is so easy when the enemy puts a little lure of sexual temptation out in front of you. It's so easy like a hungry fish to bite on that, man. And then, boom, he's got you. It says, be careful. Be careful when you're fixated on on my pain, my struggle, the difficulty of life, my friends. And all I can think about is all that's wrong and I'm starting to kind of be negative and complaining and grumbling. Those are the moments where the enemy puts this temptation in front of you sexually and you you say this to yourself, well, I deserve it. My life is so bad and God's not taking care of me. So why wouldn't I fill in the blank? And the enemy will just keep throwing different lures out in front of you in those moments. And, And if you keep your focus here, it's so tense. But if you turn back and say, but wait a minute. God is good and God is beautiful. As a matter of fact, sexual intimacy and the gift of male and female is a gift from God. Do you know this? Do you know that in the Bible, at the very beginning, in Genesis, in the garden, before before any sin came into the world, in perfect Edenic paradise, there's a man and there's a woman and they're naked. Pastor said naked, yeah. Yeah. There's a man, there's a woman. They're naked. And you know what God says? Be fruitful and multiply. You know what that means? Some of you are helping out. Thank you. Uh, (laughs) it It means make babies. Right? And there's no sin in the world. This is perfection. God is a huge fan of sex. He invented it. It's just that God says it's a wonderful gift in the right parameters, the way I designed it. The problem is we take off the parameters and just kind of make it anything we want it to be. But God says, and so, and so we've got to be on the side where we say, I understand the goodness of this gift. And be careful that when all you focus on is the pain and struggle of life, when the enemy puts those lures and temptations with sexual immorality, turn back and say, God, I want to see your goodness. I want to see your good plan. And remember your provision. I don't need that. Because you know what? Those things are going to end up empty. Number three, don't put God to the test. When God has proven himself trustworthy over and over again. Don't get in this place where you're questioning God. Is God faithful? Is God good? Does God care? I mean, I'm going through this momentary struggle, whatever it is, as big or small as it is. I'm, and I'm not, not making light of anybody's struggles or the struggles of those you love. They're deep and they're real and they're profound. But when you see God's goodness and presence and glory and how faithful he's been to you over and over and over again, man, that will keep your heart locked with Jesus Christ. Sometimes we need to just turn our hearts back to God and remember his faithfulness. Number four, and here's where we're going to focus today. Don't be a whiner and grumbler when there's so much to be thankful for. Don't be that person who always notices what's wrong in this situation, in this person, at this restaurant, at this school, at this fill in the blank, at this anything and everything I can ever see, I can find something to pick apart. Don't be that person who grumbles and complains incessantly, perpetually, unyieldingly. Don't be that person. Because a grumbling spirit is a spirit of sin. Because if we'll stop focusing on what we don't have, what we don't like, and what we're against, and what we're upset about, and we'll turn and remember God's faithfulness and goodness and provision, we'll realize we just don't have a lot to whine about. Because God has been so good. 
Now, what if there's times that there's really a concern we should deal with? We'll get to that. Because we should handle real tough things at times. We'll get there before the sermon's done. But back at the biblical text, verse 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The Apostle Paul tells us this. I love this. These things happen to them as examples, and look at this now, and were written down as warnings for who? Us, on whom the culmination of the ages has come. These warnings, God in his word by his Holy Spirit gave me us these four warnings, and this one in particular we're going to focus on gratitude and thankfulness rather than grumbling and complaining. This is an example for us. And so, the antidote to grumbling and whining is consistent and intentional thankfulness. It's not the only antidote, but I think it's the primary one. If you want an antidote to being that person who always has to say something negative, always criticize something, always point out what's wrong, it's just in your soul, it's in your mouth, it's almost like it burns in you, you can't not say it because you just have to say it to everyone or to someone. If you just, if you just find that within yourself, the antidote is saying, it's not just saying, I'm not going to be negative and complain. It's saying, God, I want to become a thankful person. Because it's hard to be thankful when you're always complaining. And it's also hard to complain and whine when you're being consistently thankful. And so God's calling us not just to one day a year of maybe being thankful or maybe complaining about all that happened at Thanksgiving, but he's calling to every day of our lives walking as thankful people. So I'm going to share with you 10 ideas or thoughts around this concept of thankfulness that come out of the biblical text that we looked at today. If you're a note taker, you can write these down or kind of lock them in your mind and your heart and take one or two of these and start to kind of take some action on these. I will be thankful because, number one, God is with me. Like a pillar of cloud and fire, God is closer than we think. And some of us will say, some of us will say this, we'll say, well, listen, I mean, if, yeah, if I could look outside my house or my apartment or my trailer and see a pillar of fire, yeah, I'd believe God's with me. But would you? Really? Are you sure? Because the people of Israel, God's right there, and they're saying, where's God? We we become aware of God's presence when we actually slow down and look at how God is with us. I remember when I first became a Christian. I I grew up in a home with no Christian faith, no Bible reading. The the only story I knew in the whole Bible, when I first time I read through it, the only story that was familiar was out of the Gospel of Luke, and it's the part that Linus quotes in a Charlie Brown Christmas. Remember, he says, oh, no, Charlie Brown, that's not Christmas. And then, then Linus goes, you know, there were shepherds in the field, and the angels came, and they were sore afraid. And I started, you know, Linus does the whole thing. And I read that in the Bible. I'm like, oh, my gosh. I'm thinking, I'm thinking Luke ripped that off from Linus. <laughs> and I realized, oh, no, no, Linus took it from Luke. I mean, I knew nothing. I knew nothing in the Bible. And yet when I became a follower of Jesus and realized that God was with me, I started looking back in my life for the previous 16 years. And I could see the presence of God. Oh, even though my parents didn't teach me about Jesus, even though I didn't have a single friend that went to church, I could look back and see that God had been with me. Can I encourage you to slow down sometime in the next 24 hours and look back over the last week and month and year and decade and just notice a pillar of fire and a pillar of cloud because God's been with you. We just forget to notice Because there's hard things that get our attention. But let's remember the presence of God and acknowledge when he shows up because God shows up in our lives. Number two, I will be thankful because God protects me. He still parts the sea and he still closes it on our enemies. The Bible tells us that when you become a follower of Jesus, when you come to the cross and confess your sins and receive Jesus Christ, the word of God says that the Holy Spirit of God moves into you. The, spirit, the living spirit of Christ lives inside of you, never leaves, and he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. And God still wins victories over the enemy. God still parts the Red Sea of whatever you're facing if you'll seek his face and follow him and trust him. And, and, and so we've got to understand and say, God is a God who protects me and watches over me. When I look back on my life, I'll be honest with you, there are at least a hundred times I should have been dead in my life with the dumb things I did as a kid and even the dumb things I did as a young adult. And the thing, I mean, it just, you know, there's no reason, I mean, and and I've got a feeling one day I'll I'll stand before Jesus face to face and he'll say, oh, you got to watch this and see how I protected you. I get this this highlight reel for like the first thousand years, you know, (laughs) all the dumb things I did and how God said, oh, angel there, protect you there. What were you thinking? I love you. Don't, you know, you're still alive. You know, and, but, 
But God is with you. God protects you. And ask for his protection and ask for you to see how he's watching over you. But become thankful because you know that God continues to protect you. I will be thankful because God provides in amazing ways. So I'm not getting manna, I'm not getting quail, I'm not getting water from a rock, but God is in miraculous, glorious ways providing for you and for me every day of our lives. The problem is, and can I say this pastorally but clearly, the problem is we are so stinking spoiled. We, we become so used to having so much. I was, I was doing some research trying to get a sense of how the world has changed and how comfortable we've become and we don't even realize it. Here's a couple things I learned. 150 years ago, the average person in America lived on a dollar a day. Now, you're saying, well, that's a dollar then, but that's like $1,000 now. No, no, the equivalent of what a dollar would be today. The average person in America lived in poverty. I mean, I mean dollar a day poverty. Sustenance, scraping through. We've been so blessed. 200 years ago, the average age that a man or a woman in the Americas would pass away and die. Now, watch this now. Just under 40 years old. 200 years ago, just under 40. If you are 40 years old or older, and you're comfortable doing so, please raise your hand high in the air, okay? If you're 40 or older, okay? You know, you know how like 40 is the new 30? You know, or, or 50 is, keep your hand up, 50 is the new 40. Okay, 200 years ago, 40 was the new dead, okay? <laughs> we'd, all, we'd, we'd all be gone, man. I'd have been gone, 16 years gone, you know? Oh, I just don't have, I, I just, you know, God has been good. And in and, and, and the war of 1812, over half the soldiers died, not because they didn't die in battle, they died of sicknesses in hospitals. Over half the soldiers. Why? Because the things that we can take a pill for now that make us better didn't exist back then. We have so many blessings. And we've got to recognize those and see those. Say, God has provided for me in amazing ways and I will give him thanks. Number four, I will be thankful because God is better than stuff. Someone say Amen. God is better than stuff. Say that with me. You ready? God is better than stuff. It's true. And so when God provides for us, great. It's a toy. It's a thing. I enjoy it. But I I celebrate the giver of the gift. And I don't fix it on the gift. Or I don't have that gift. I fix it on the God who gives all good and perfect gifts. And when I understand that, it changes my life. Because God is better than getting more stuff. I'll be thankful, number five. Because God has made us male and female, and this is a glorious wonder. I will thank God for the beauty of his creation. And the fact that he's made men and women unique and distinct and beautiful and equal in his sight, but partners in life. What a gift from God. I'll thank God for that beautiful gift. Number six, I will be thankful because God is trustworthy. The people of Israel could look back and they could say, he set us free from Egypt. He parted the Red Sea. He's given us all that we need. We can trust in God. And the problem is when we focus on what we don't have, we say, well, you can't, I can't trust God because of this one thing, not because of these 50 things that he already did that showed his trustworthiness. And some of these things that we don't trust God about, he's going to surprise us some, someday about how he's going to take care of that. But right now, it's just not going the way we want it to go. So we can whine and complain and grumble. And God says, understand and that, that, that I have been trustworthy in your life. Number seven, I will show my thankfulness by refusing to grumble and complain. I will pay attention to my words and my attitude and my spirit, and I will say, I will not live in the camp of the grumbler, of the complainer. So when I find myself just, uh, just I just have to, point out what's wrong and grumble and complain about it, I'm, I'm going to start by just shutting my mouth. I'm going to invite a couple people around me who know my patterns to say, you know, just kind of, may just say, hey, when I start doing it, just, just look at me and just go, you're doing it, and give me a little smile. You're doing it. Would you dare to ask someone if you're grumbling and complaining to let you know, to point it out? Most of us don't have the courage to do that, but we should. Because here's the thing, when we finally start starting to complain, I don't have or I want or I don't like, and if we shut our mouths, we don't, just say, I, we don't just say, I don't want to grumble. We say, no, I want to actually go in the camp of those who celebrate the goodness of God. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. 
His love endures forever. I want to speak words of thanks and praise to God because as I do that, I don't have any time to grumble and complain. So I'm going to pay attention to myself and I'm going to watch myself. Today, you know, before five o'clock today, some of you might have 25 opportunities not to grumble or complain. You might just go, man, that's all I do. Some of you are going to go, I'm going to, oh, I, can't, I can't talk. I can't say anything because everything's, no, that's, no, no. Okay, no, nothing. I got nothing, right? And then you might walk over here and say, the God who parted the Red Sea and the God who set his slaves free from Egypt and brought them into a promised land and the God who brought manna from heaven and water from a rock, that's my God. And I thank you for the little things and the big things and the things that we have not yet experienced but that I have in Jesus how would your life change and your workplace and your marriage and your family change if rather than whining and complaining and grumbling perpetually, you were giving thanks to the Lord for he is good and you were noticing his goodness and his provision and his power and his glory. That will change your life. It will change every environment that God has put you in. Refuse to be a person who grumbles and complains. Number eight, I will show my thankfulness by handling my concerns with grace and wisdom. Here's what I want to say to you. Some of you in your mind are saying, well, I, okay, okay, yeah, it's fine not to grumble, complain, or whine, but what if something's really going wrong and it should really be dealt with? Then I would say, deal with it. But that's not grumbling and complaining. Here's the key, and I worded this very carefully. You say this, I will go to the right person at the right time with the right spirit seeking a God-honoring result. That's not complaining. That's addressing a real challenge. Here's an example. When, we, when Shoreline moved into this building, it was shortly after I became pastor here. When Shoreline moved into this building, it was a warehouse. This was not built to be a church building. You might have noticed that. It's looking nicer as time goes by, but this room had you know, shelves and stock in it. It wasn't, it wasn't made as a worship center. So when we moved in here, the sound in this room was terrible. It was bounced all over the place. If you look on the wall, see all these weird shaped uh, things all over the walls? Those aren't decorations. That's soundboards put in exact places to make this as good as we can for sound because it wasn't built to be what we have it as. But God gave us this place. It was a gift. So we're not complaining, but we were, and so, but, but so when people, when people left here and the, the music and the sound wasn't quite right, if they went and talked to 10 people out in the lobby and complained and whined about the sound, who couldn't do anything to fix it, that would be sin. That's whine, that's sin. It breaks the heart of God. But if that same person would have gone to our sound person or to one of the pastors and at the right time when the right spirit said, hey, I noticed it's really loud where we sit and it's kind of hard to hear and the, music, the music's bouncing, can we, and can we get that fixed and what can we do? That, that's fine. See, going to the right person, you see the difference? Go to the right person with the right spirit, with the right desire, with the right heart in place. Then yes, bring those things, share those things and we'll tackle those together. So when that, as, as that was happening at Shoreline, when people bring those concerns, we started working on the room here, and we put this, more sound things up, and we equalized the room, and there's a chart on the wall over there that's actually a heat chart, where it's red, it's the loudest in the room, where it's green, it's the quietest in the room. It's like, this is the best we can make this room. We've, it's, the, the worship this morning was beautiful, and the sound was great. I hope where you were sitting, but if it was too loud for you, and if you look in that thing, and you oh, I'm in a red zone, by the way, right here, red zone, okay? Um, <laughs> But if you're in the red zone, you go, it's a little bit loud. Oh, but here's a yellow or a green zone. I can move myself to a place where the sound's quieter for me. Great. Well, we did all that because people came with the right spirit. So, so when we say don't complain and grumble and whine, that's going to the wrong people with the wrong spirit and just dumping. That's sin. But going to the right people with the right spirit is called wisdom and maturity. Please do that in your marriages, in your families, in your workplace. But don't be a grumbler and whiner. Be a person who addresses things the right way. Number nine. I will show my thankfulness by telling God I am thankful on a daily basis. That every day, I'm going to make time to say thank you to God. I'm going to take out my phone, and I'm going to have a little note in my phone. I'm just going to add one or two or three thankful things to God. I'm going to write something in a journal. Or I'm just going to sit quietly at the end of the day, and I'm going to say, God, boy, the drive over to church this morning, after the rain and the fresh air and the blue sky is beautiful. Thank you for the beauty of Monterey. God, the, 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 the chocolate old-fashioned donut that somebody came early and prepared for me was delicious. Thank you, Jesus. You know, whatever, a couple things. This person who I delight in, the smile of this person, whatever it is. God, I woke up this morning, and my back didn't hurt like it did the last two weeks. It didn't feel as bad. Thank you, Jesus, for a little relief from the pain. Just to be consistent, I will daily thank the Lord. That will change your life. And number 10, 
I will show my thankfulness by telling others about how good God has been. I won't just tell God the good things I notice. I'll tell other people. I'll share with my family. I'll share with my friends the good gifts that God has given, the beauty of what I've experienced in life. I, I, I'm not going to keep talking about all the negative things and what's wrong with everything, but I'm going to talk about the good and the beautiful and the wonderful things that God is allowing us to experience, that God is doing in our lives, in my life. And I'll talk with others openly and freely about the good things. You want to be radically counterculture in our world today? Just talk about good stuff. People will be waiting, and... Well, I'm really happy, and this is wonderful, and? It's like, no, there's no and. I'm just thankful. But no, come on, there's got to be something. No, I'm just delighting in the goodness of God. At the end of every day, I wonder if your day finished, if there was a signature at the base of your day, just kind of at the end of the day, you're laying down for the night. Is it going to say, whining, grumbling, and complaining, your name here? <laughs> Or is it going to say, with thanks, Kevin Garth Harney? Every day, with thanks, your name here. For you live like that, it's powerful. I was talking with Pastor Dennis this morning. He mentioned that even in the recent test, scientific tests, they're showing that a thankful spirit, speaking thankful words, what was the term you used to reroute your neural? remaps your neural pathways towards goodness and good things. Lord Jesus, we pray that our hearts would be wired, our minds would be wired, and our lips would be moved towards thankfulness and praise. God, you know our lives, that every day and every moment of our, of our family, of our marriage, of our workplace, of our free time, there's, there's joy and beauty and glory, and there's pain and struggle and sorrow. This is every day. But may we sign the day with hearts that say, with thanks to God, with thanks to God, with thanks to God. May we declare it and live it and be transformed and the world around us transformed by hearts that are filled with thankfulness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.